Not really. Oh, yeah, is it okay? Yeah. okay? Okay. Hi, my name is Tiago. I um, I'll be presenting a bar today. Um, before we start, I just wanted because I, there was a couple of changes. We were going to use uh, for the, the tutorials are all in the uh, are, are will be on your computers through the bar update side. So before we start, I just wanted all of you to to please have your um, Fiji updated. So just run um, help update. We can do it together if you want to. And well, let's. And if you haven't done so, I'll do it with you. So basically, just open your Fiji installation, just go on help, and press update Fiji. And if you haven't done so, um, please subscribe to the bar update site. And OK. I, hello. OK. Or help update, sorry. OK, I have some. So the way you do this, if you haven't done so, you just go to manage update sites, you click on bar, and then you, um, you are good to go. OK? So let me know if any of you has problems, if you haven't done so. It's just because I, I had to, I changed some of the tutorials yesterday night, last minute. So it would be nice if you could have all of it. Um, there was another, one thing I noticed is actually, if you have, subs if you have subscribed to, um, to the image, image development update side, there is going to be a conflict. So you please, I would ask you just for, if you are doing it so, just please unsubscribe it just for the workshop and then you can reactivate it again. So if you are subscribing here, okay? Just because we will be using a lot of the script editor and some things will, will be broken otherwise. Is, is it okay? Oh, sorry. You have to subscribe the bar update side. The other ones, is we won't use them, okay? The only conflict is that if you are subscribing the ImageA development web, up, uh, update site, you, we're going to run into conflict, okay? So, uh, okay, so let's start. Okay, so I'm not so sure if we're going to have time to do everything, um, but um, so I'm going to give you first an overview and then we'll see how time, what time allowing, how it goes. So. First of all, my name is Thiago. I'm from McGill University, Montreal, up there in Canada. And I just wanted to, um, you know, so today um, to give you some hands-on um, um, experience on the on bar scripts or the bar update side. But basically, so, uh, so the goals for today would be for for you to get familiar with the uh, with with bar. We also uh, I thought about using um, as an example for. Um, uh, for a walkthrough for scripting languages. So Fiji supports several languages, supports Python, Pinshell, JavaScript, DMJ macro language, and Ruby and Clojure, and which is a Lisp, I guess. Uh, and so, but, um, so today I thought about these two languages as an example. Bar supports pretty much all of them, you'll see la later on. And um, I think I forgot Ruby also, but that, those, anyway, those are details. And then so, so this is the first part. So if you already have experience, um, basic experience on scripting language, we may skip these ones. So please let me know if you want to. So I will say we start first with some really basic introduction to these, um, you know, to scripting in Python and Bintel. But if you think it's you know boring because you, you have seen it all, and we can just skip it and move ahead, okay? Um, and then so first, the, and then the the perhaps the most important part of the workshop is I think. Um, it is idea of um, uh, modular scripting in which, you know, if um, uh, in, in snippets of code can be reused throughout all your routines. And, I, and this was the rationale why uh, I, I created BAR. So this is perhaps the most important part of the workshop. And so, um, so this is what we're going to do today. And then for the long terms, I guess what this workshop should be about is to make you more productive when you are scripting image A. And then to remind you of the importance of modular code. Okay, so basically code that you can reuse multiple times in your routines. And, and for me, and would be very, very honored if you would become a bar contributor also. So if you start contributing to bar. So, so okay, so I'm assuming that you guys have all these together um, assembled. So let's start. Okay, so another thing I wanted to, sorry, I, all, I don't want to annoy you. Um, but I always come across, well, I came across this already a couple of times where, um, you know, when you ask someone that uses 
uh, IMAJ and you ask why do you want to script IMAJ or why do you want to develop, you know, to create routines for IMAJ? And most of the times the answer is that, well, because it reduces my workload, makes me faster, makes me, allows me to analyze more images. And the other one, which is uh, quite obvious, is that because all other, you know, software out there doesn't, doesn't fulfill my needs. But I would say another very important that people neglect, um, most of us neglect uh, frequently, is that scripting is, is an entry uh, uh, door to reproducible and science. So if, you script, you know, if, you, if your image processing is done through scripts, it means that you can share it with other people, they can analyze the, same, the image in the same way that you do it, and you can do it in a reproducible manner. So even if, no matter what you take from this workshop, I would say that please take this as a, a, you know, as a take home message, that your scripts and macros are the perfect media to make your work accessible, reproducible, and so please do make it available to your peers. And I'll, as, a, as an anecdote, actually, I want to tell you that if, this idea that the reason why I'm not a, I'm not a programmer, I, never had, I don't have formal training um, in, in software um, uh, development. And when I started, um, so I, I'm actually I'm a, I'm a, I'm a full trained biologist. I have never done anything else than um, um, uh, wet bench experiments. And so, um, and I want to tell you that the reason why the, my entry point into development for, for ImageJ was I started using the macro recorder as a lab book for my image processing. And I can tell it's very anecdotal, but I think it does make the point about this idea that scripting can be your, can, it's very important for producers. So for instance, if you, if you, you know, simple things that anyone can do with or without knowledge for, um, for um, without scripting knowledge, if you just make your, you know, any routines you do, you open an image, you smooth, then you can write some comments here, this worked, you know, then you can threshold it, an image, and then you apply, and then you can make a comment here and say, this failed, and that's it, there you go. You have now a log of what you, that you wrote that you can save, you can restore, you can share with your colleagues in the lab. And this was pretty much how I started developing for ImageJ. And so that's it. So first things first, what is bar? Well, the way I define it is a created collection of plugins, macros, and scripts in multiple uh, languages that will streamline image usage, OK? And also, this is actually true. Um, at a certain point, Johannes was really helping me a lot in the, in the other projects I was doing. And I was always telling you, I owe you a beer, I owe you a beer. And at a certain point, I said, you know what? It would be much cheaper for me if I open the bar just to pay you all those beers, and I guess that's the rationale for the, for the name. So what does BAR do? BAR does a couple of things. Uh, it's a mixed bag, but I think it, it's organized in a coherent matter. Well, uh, at least it tries to. And so I will just show you a couple of things before we start. So this is just going to be a more demonstrative thing. Oops. I guess the cable was some. Okay, there you go. So one thing that BAR tries to do is to be a graphic user interface for uh, things that are hidden in the image a API, or also a, a, a graphic user interface for libraries that are third-party libraries that are bundled with PG. So PG has great uh, third-party libraries that are not accessible for most users unless you are uh, a, a full pr programmer and you are trying to access them. So I'll give you an example, for instance. I'll give you a couple of, uh, of examples. So one of them is, um, it's called the create, uh, so I'll just hide this window here, I'll close these ones. So as you saw from Wayne's presentation this morning, ImageA has, has inc incredibly powerful um, capabilities for plotting, for generating plots. And so, but, um, but these capabilities have to be accessed through either for a macro or for a script. They cannot be really accessed through the interface. So this is an example um, of, a, of a bar script. So I'm just going to have open here some demo data. So here we have a results table with some measurements. You can imagine that we measured a couple of cells. And now you want to create a plot. So you will just interactively you know, pick your columns and start adding data sets. And it will automatically generate for you. So you can import a spreadsheet, ta a spreadsheet table, drag it into ImageJ, and then use a bar script to create a plot. And you can also create vector field plots. Um, as, you, as Wayne showed you before, 
And again, you can do, this is just a simple bin shell script, a couple of hundreds of, well, hundreds of lines of code, and you would, and there you go. So that's back to shell. Okay, so that's one example of what I mean by making the AP, image API accessible to, um, um, from the graphic user interface. The other one is um, here, the create box plot. So image, uh, Fiji comes with uh, uh, JFruit the JavaScripting library, which is really uh, powerful. But again, you can only access if you are writing a plugins or uh, most users won't have access to it. So you could, the idea is that you could actually create something like this, a box plot, which is very useful in science. You know, let's, let's sort it, let's now group our data by type there, the label column, and you can create a box plot, okay? You can add all the points also. I'm going to repeat, repeat it again. So let's say I want to plot all the data. Okay, and now importantly, image, uh, sorry, PG also comes with uh, uh, libraries for exporting SVG graphics, for exporting uh, data as PDFs. And so for bar, you can come here, export these, and there you go, you have a, a box plot that you can you know, use in your publications. So those are two examples of what I mean by accessing, giving a, a, a graphic interface for um, all the goodies that are inside of Fiji. And the other one is, um, uh, the other one, the things that uh, bar scripts have in common is that they modernize ImageA um, image, uh, one built-in command. So for instance, let's open a sample image here. I'm going to open a multi-channel one, um, perhaps this one. I'll just adjust the brightness a bit, change channel. Okay, and now I'm going, let's make a, a profile plot of this. Okay, perfect. The live feature is great, it's incredible. It allows you to you know, dynamically uh, sample uh, lines throughout the image. But you can see here, it's, quite, it's somehow limited in a way that if you remove channel, it only plots one channel at a time, but this is a multi-channel you know, image, so what happens if I want to see both emails at the same time? Well, through the API, image is very easy. Just create a script to do it. So let's go now, we're going to have a bar that is going to you know, be a be a power utilization of the of the built-in command. Okay, so and the, and again because it's fully integrated in MJ. So for instance, if you bring the channels to and I remove the channel, sorry because I select the wrong one. So if I toggle the channel, you toggle also the line in the graph. If I change, sorry, if I change the line, if I change the the lookup table, I change also the lookup table in the graph. And so, um, so that's one example. Okay, another example is, let's say that you have, so I'm going to close all the images. Hopefully I'm not creating too much pollution on the screen. Um, so another example, let's say you have a couple, you have, typically you want to measure something in ImageA. Um, you want to be, um, you want to have a, an idea of what you have measured so far. So you would run the uh, distribution command you would pick, and then ImageA would produce this, um, this histogram, um, which is great, but you can see it's not very, um, doesn't give you much information. All the, all the descriptive statistics are there, but it, you know, is it, does it fit a normal distribution? Does, does it not? How does it work? And you can see that actually is somehow there's a limitation there. So what about writing just a, a generalized macro that you can apply all over the, uh, your routines? And, and that's the example here. In this case, with distribution plotter, so it offers multiple um, ways to bin uh, your data, and then there you go. It fits a, a Gaussian distribution on your histogram, and it plots also at the same time um, a cumulative distribution. So it's much more intuitive and much more informative than the original built-in command. Okay, and as Wayne showed you before, this is all much more uh, friendly to use than. The and this is what I mean. So bar stands for broadly applicable routine. So the idea is that every, all these scripts do one thing only, but they do it well and they do it in a broad way that you can generalize it without, without restrictions. Okay, so another, f so that was the modernization part. So the other one is, for instance, productivity tools. I don't know you, but I'm always in the need for creating lists of images. So for instance, if I have, if I'm looking at, um, 
I'm a neuroscientist, so I, I typically look at a brain from mutants and wild-type animals. And I always have to sort images for controls on one side and mutants on the other side. And so I work with files a lot. And so but it, image A is great, but there, I never really found a way that it would allow me to access uh, files easily. And as Wayne showed before, image A has great um, features like the, the, the command finder that Wayne showed you before, where you can sort things uh, around. Fiji has an also very useful command um, called the recent commands menu that I guess you, you that allows you to ha have your commands listed. And so what about doing the same thing for files? Now this is perhaps the most sophisticated bar, so the, it's slightly more complex, so it had to be a Java plugin. And, and so, and, and this is a, a typical, is a, a, a file browser that you can control with your keyboard. So for instance, if I, um, if I want to access the samples image, it comes with a console. So I, I type the hotkey for the console, I type samples, and now I have my images here on the samples folder. I can sort them by tips, for instance. So now I have all the tips. And importantly, I can print those lists. So I go here and I press a print current list, which failed for some weird reason. Of course, it had to fail. And OK, it's just placing on, it's detecting the other screen. So now you have all the tips here. If I want all the JPEGs of an image, I guess it's three letter nomenclature. And then I will print this list also. OK, so now you have a list of JPEGs. You could have a list of controls. And then for this list, you can have other scripts that you can parse through them. Of course, you can open them, as always, in image by double-clicking on them. Okay. So just to give you an idea, so this is an example of productivity tools. Um, so that's it. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, go to presentation mode again. And so, so these were the two, um, the three aspects we talked about. So um, providing an interface for uh, Fiji goodies to modernize some imaging commands that uh, extend uh, built-in commands to, to, to more image types, for instance, and to provide you productivity tools. But the other idea of BAR, so the idea of BAR is really to help you creating, accessing, organizing your own script routines, okay? And this is what's going to be the scope of the workshop today. And of course, the other thing is also to encourage community, con uh, community contribution. So if you have a script that you want to be included, please go ahead. This, the idea of BAR is that everybody, you know, it's an open, um, the source code is all in GitHub. Please, um, you know, criticize it, comment, and, and help it uh, its development. Okay, so let's start now. So, I'll just close this. So I thought about starting first. It's um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that um, all bars are pretty much uh, single scripts, and you know that. Um, a feature of image A that when implemented some years ago and I really I, I really like it is that you can so the menu hierarchy as you saw it from today's talk in the, in, in, in the image A reflects the plugin hierarchy so a subfolder will become a submenu in the plugin uh, and so and when you have a script you can just shift click on the entry and it will open the file and I love this because it, it allows you to dynamically edit things last minute or change things so you know if you want to see the source code for this Python script, you just press Shift, and it will open in the script editor. Okay. And so, uh, what we're going to do? So, we're going to take advantage of that feature here. So, I, I, I created a folder of tutorials in the snippets um, directory of, of uh, Bar. I'll tell you in a second what it is, what these scripts are for. And so, let's start first with the Python tutorials, and they will open in the. They should open in your um, script editor, and pretty much one each of these lessons is going to be one of these files. And so I didn't know really what would be you know, um, your background. So I, this, I thought it would be useful to start with the basics. But again, do interrupt me if you know, this, is, um, this is too basic for you. Okay? So I thought about starting with Python. Um, so is anyone, do you have any questions? Or am I annoying you? Or no? <laughs> it's all good? So I first decided Python because Python is really uh, is a beautiful language to read. Actually, it looks almost as most of you will know like pseudocode that is actually executable, 
And so just to provide you, OK, so let's just go through the basics. And again, sorry, is there, is there here someone that doesn't know Python? OK. OK, two people. OK, three people, three and a half, four and a half, OK. Uh, OK, so, okay, so I'll do this. I'll try to go this fast, but in, a, in a, hopefully in a coherent manner. Okay, so what you have here, so Python's you comment lines with a with a number sign, you can do it in two ways. So these are all in green. You see that these are comments, and I wanted for this workshop, so you, for instance, Python has some built-in statements, so built-in functions. So one of them is the print. So you can just you know if you select this line and you press run selected code, it will print on your console hello, okay on line 20 of your code. Um, so it's straightforward. Math works as you would expect it. So if you have, you know, you, you, can, you can make the numeric operations di directly, and you can also send it to the print statement. And so, you know, one thing that most scripting lang languages will have is that um, division can be a bit special because you typically, or if you don't define the, the um, the type of your variable that you were working. So for instance, let's run this code here. So you can see that if I divide three by four, because it's it's an integer and it's not a double number, so it will provide zero, because it, and it's a division to the, um, it doesn't allow decimals, so I have to type in 3.0, 4.0 to have um, the, the, the accurate result. And this will be true for most scripting languages, whether it be bin shell or, um, or Python. Okay, cool thing of, so Python is very flexible, so a cool thing that I, it's, it, it's really cool to play with. So for instance, you can multiply strings also, so if you want to press, if you want to print hello three times, you just type three times hello, and you run the selected code, there you go, hello, 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 here, on the back of your screen. I realize now that you are not seeing anything, because the, the font is too small. Sorry about that, you should have told me. So I'm going, okay. Hopefully it's more. Um, hopefully it's more visible now. Okay, so um, these are Python operators. Okay, so you've, if if you can say two variables are the same, you use the keyword is. If they are different, you use is not. If you want to um, make logical operations, you say and, and so forth. And so I will skip through 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 this. Um, I'll just show you one another. Um, neat thing about Python, which are dictionaries, where you basically can store mappings between keys and values. So you can associate two things. So for instance, if you have John, you can associate it with his, with his phone number. But you can do this with any objects. You can do this with a list also. So you can use it basically with an array of values, and you can associate it to, an, to a key to that. So for instance, if I, so um, let's say, um, uh, you know, so you can always have a key values pair. So for instance, if I have, I can have the key Cuba Libre and I can associate it to the value Roman Coke. Whenever time I want to know what Roman Coke is, I have the key Cuba Libre and so forth. And this is a cool thing of Python. It's very useful. Um, and so um, these are these are try um, try statements. Sorry, I think, because I can look for you, I think you guys are all Annoyed a bit by this, um, we can go back to this. So I'll, I'll move on, I'll move forward on the on the on the tutorial. Okay, so we passed basically uh, the, the part one. So these are if statements. You use it for doubt in every language. It's very uh, uh, very common. So um, so cool thing of Python is that it's so simplistic. So for instance, if you have a list of values, so um, uh, an array of values, and if you want to know if certain um, values are present, so you just need to say, for instance, if you have a, a variable source that the, the, the value of 10, if you want to know if that 10 is a list, you just write if variable in my list, then print. Um, and so we can run this, and you can see on your consoles that you basically there for line 11, you will have the, um, uh, for line 12, you would have that A is in your list. And so multiple if statements are with a, a el if uh, keyword. These are for loops. Um, and again, everything is very, very flexible in Python. OK, so I'll just move forward to the other. Um, so we can move 
pass through this. Okay. So now importing. So probably the one thing that you you know already, I guess the the uh, the Python that is uh, available in Fiji is actually a Jiten, which is a Java uh, um, uh, interpretation of Python. So basically, so these um, you you don't need to care much about it. You just need to know that certain um, models that you would be uh, ava available in, in in proper Python will not be available in Jiten. Um, so let's say now that you want to import a module. So you just type in the, the, the keyword import as you would do it in Java, okay? And so that's the, so for instance, this allows you to, uh, if you import the math module, it allows you to make um, mathematical operations. So if you run this, you will obtain the value of pi there on your line nine. But you, of course, you can also import Java um, uh, classes. So it has, so the equivalent for the, the Python uh, math model would be, sorry, the Jiten math model would be the, the the math class in the that belongs to Java, so you obtain exactly the same value. Okay, and the a cool thing about Jiten is actually you can actually you can put any import anywhere in your script. So in Java, typically you would put a, uh, in the beginning of your of your file, import statements would you in 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 the Python script can go anywhere. So you can declare a variable, you can import in this case the random module, and then you can pick a random choice, for instance. From your uh, list of tricks, the team of the of since we are talking about bar, the team you know it's not a coincidence all the variables are named after drinks, and I thought it was appropriate. Okay, cool. So let's go now to some more useful stuff. So um, functions. Um, um, so functions are defined with the. Uh, uh, def keyword. Okay. So for instance, if you want to define um, Function that prints the date of today. Okay, so you will import the module date time. There's a link for the documentation um, if you want to read more about it, how it works, and then um, read, you know uh, functions return value. So you can return um, the value of today. Then you could print it also, and then um, and that's the example there on line 16, 17, and you can use the string function to convert it to a string. And you can see how the output would look like in both line 16 and 17 there. OK, so that was a function without arguments. Of course, you can, you can define arguments. And so here is a Siri function that returns the smallest value of two numbers, um, which is kind of silly because there is already a built-in um, built function for it in Python. Um, OK, but another cool thing about Python that is very useful also and this is perhaps more practical, is that you can, um, you, can, you can try to import something that you don't know if the users you will have access to it. So imagine that you are requiring a third part library and they reduce it in your script, and, um, and so, but you don't know if the user installed it or not. So you can, you know, you can still make your code in a way that it will run with an, an alternative path. So let's go and check this example here. So for instance, so imagine that you have you know, a weird, package it's, it's, that doesn't exist, but it's called cocktail, and you have a, a, you know, a module that is called the best drink ever. Okay, so you can, make, you can put your a try statement in your, uh, in, in your function. So you can say try to import this package, it's to the, import this module, and if, if it's successful, then do something. But then you can, you, know, you can graciously exit or do an alternative code, execution code. You know, if the, the import was not there and if it failed, then define the function, define that module in place. And this is very, uh, is a very neat feature. Um, okay, okay, so, um, another thing that is, you use it for the um, Python scripts also, is that you will see that, um, is this idea of global variables. So variables that are general for your script and they are shared across, um, across modules. So for instance, um, imagine that you have a variable that's called best rum and you, you, know, you think it's Bacardi. And then you, know, you, have, um, and you, set, you have a function and you want to modify it within the scope of that function. You want to modify that variable that was uh, you know, defined upstream. You have to use a global keyword 
And this is because Python really wants to make sure that you, are, you want to you know, change that variable. Okay, so for instance, this would work. So if you run this function, this would work. You would be able to change um, Astron because you specifically told Python, yes, I'm aware of what I'm doing. I want to, sh to change that variable. But if you don't do it, it won't work because the variable even has the same name, it will be defined only within the scope of the function. Okay, so. I guess now the idea is how do you know which models to use? Why do you get the documentation? Because uh, typically if you, if you are not a, you know, a full flat um, developer, you won't have an IDI, you won't be using Eclipse, you, will, you only have access to the the script editor. So how do you know which models to use? Why do you know how, which libraries are there available for Fiji? How does an amateur developer find out where, you know, what it can be script or not? Well, um, there are two ways, I think. Both of them are very useful, uh, productive. So one of them is using the, the, uh, to the Java, using the, Java, the, the, uh, the Javadocs portal that uh, is available for Fiji. If you don't know the link, don't worry about it. You can use the about bar command. So you can see there's a couple of resources here. So one of them is the, okay, I guess I didn't accept. Let's try again. Okay, where pretty much you have, you have access to all, um, um, all the libraries and all the components that are bundled in Fiji. And Curtis added some, um, some later, some third-party libraries here also. So, for instance, Jeffrey Shard, recent that we used to create a box plot, and of course, you you, you know, then it, you can you can open them, you can browse them, and you can search. They're um, so highly indexed, so it's very easy to find. You know, if you are looking for uh, a plot, you just search for it, and you'll be able to find easily um, uh, your way through the documentation. Also, you, or you can use the search portal, which is allows you, allows you to search pretty much all the code resources that are available for you. I guess most of you knew that already. Um, and the other thing, as Wayne mentioned to, to you today, is that you can use um, you can use the source code in the command finder. So um, for built-in commands, so if you have uh, I don't know some um, your favorite command, let's say the smooth function, for instance, you press the source code, and you'll be able to see how it Okay. This was just to give you an example of what we did before, but through a scripting language. So in this case, because ImageJ is capable of using, of open, um, it features a, a plugin called Browser Launcher that allows you to open uh, uh, websites. So we could just run this, and we'll open a particular um, this case, the um, in this case the documentation that we'll need for the next tutorial. Okay. So the next tutorial, we are, we're going to try to do. We're going to try to create an image with an ROI on it. And um, so I did. So what I did, I I looked through the the API for ImageJ, and I looked for which classes I needed to. And if you run, if you press run on 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 the Python 5.1 tutorial, if you press it run, it will open all the classes that we'll need to script on the next tutorial. Okay, cool. So if you've done that, if you've done that, then you know that to the, well, there are different ways of creating a new image in ImageJ, but perhaps the most convenient one is to use the new image class. Okay, so if you read the documentation, I'll just skip through it, you know that this, you, you know, that, um, if, that these are the methods that you can use to create a new image. So the way we'll do this, um, we, we import, um, we import a class, we'll assign it uh, a keyword. So in this case, we are using import uh, new image as an I. And then we first define all the parameters. So in this case, this is going to be the title of our image, going to be the dimension width, dimension height, dimension depth, and also the bit depth of the image. And if you read the documentation, you see that these are the possible values. And then we'll ask um, ImageJ to fill it in the, with a ramp gradient, okay? And we will now, we will run the instruction and we will assign it to, 
to a variable called image that will hold the, the, the image itself, which is an image, as, a image plus object, okay? And then finally, we're going to show it. If you do that, this will then happen. You open your image, so perfect. So now we have our image open. And now let's just create an ROI. Um, so this is the code that we had before. So we are here, okay? But uh, now we can just, the ROI, um, the relevant class that we uh, found by searching the Java docs is the ROI class. Very similar. We define the dimensions that we need. In this case, we're going to create a rectangular ROI. Um, and we're going to place right in the middle of the image. So these are the arguments that the method has. So the first argument is the position of the rectangle, x and y position, and the third and fourth arguments are the dimensions of the rectangle that we define arbitrarily there. Okay, and now if you look into the documentation of the image, uh, image plus class, you see that there is a method that allows you to assign an ROI for it. So we have stored ROI in the my rectangle variable. So now we can associate it with the image plus object image, and we can show everything. And the ROI should have been there. And just to give you an example. And um, OK, cool. So what about changing the ROI properties now? So what happens if you want to change the color of the ROI, if you want to change the name of the ROI, if you want to do it? So, so I thought about we could do this. Perhaps you could do this perhaps on your own. So um, just to give you an example of another um, scripting um, um, uh, uh, of scripting the yes no cancel dialogue, which ask you will ask you for a question. Okay, so can, are you able to do it? Can you do it? Yes, no. So you, you know, press yes. Cool, go ahead. So I would ask you if, if you want to do it. So how would you do it? Well, again, you have to go the relevant classes in the ROI uh, class. So you would, that has been open on your browser for you. So you would search for the, for the relevant methods, which if you want, you could you could do it, and then you would find a method that would allow it to change the color. You would find a method that allowed to change the name, and you could append it to your script. This would be a way to, you know, um, really script, um, uh, you know, one method at a time. But if you are, but the reason is that most of the times you don't even need to do that, because you can just use the macro recorder to do the work for you. So. For instance, if you, you know, if I press record, and if I now open, I'll change the recorder for uh, a suitable scripting language. In this case, Pinchel, it will work as well. So if I pick selection, selection, if I pick the keyword properties, I can write, you know, the stroke cover. Let's say I want red. Press OK. It should have become red, and now you have a command that you can just append to your script. Well, you could actually append the two lines if you don't want to change the variable. And it would work as well. So if you would append it here, if you would append it to your previous script that would be here, you, your ROI would be read without having to dig into the, into the, into the ROI class. So you can see that the recorder did two things here because the recorder doesn't know which, um, which image plus object you are working, which image you are working. So he asks image A to give you to, to, give, to, to work on the frontmost image. So in this case, um, he's again retrieving an image. Image plus object is retrieving, is the one that is frontmost. But in this case, because you've created and you know which exactly it is, you can just associate it to, your, to the image object. So you can mix and match. Um, you can mix and match um, your own scripts that you, you you do for the API documentation for the Java docs, also with uh, strings from the macro recorder, and they will work beautifully as well. And there is really no um, uh, most of the times there's really um, no ad advantage of preferring one to the other. Okay. So that was our Python overview. So if you want to know more about, again, I'm not a trained um, developer. Um, I'll hardly ever be one. 
And so I, I think what is really useful for me is to uh, you know, learn by examples. So in this case, so there are several, perhaps a third of the scripts in bar are, are written in Python. So if you want, um, you know, if you want to, to, get, to get more examples into Python scripting, you could use um, bar scripts as a template. So you just need to search for Python scripts inside. So you can do this in different ways. Um, perhaps why not just use the commander since it's there? So um, the instructions are here. So in this case, you would open the commander. And you see that there is a, already a console command for, uh, for the snippets, snippets folder. So you press snip, press enter. And now you have several. Uh, well, I have more because I haven't, I haven't placed all of them in the in the bar update side. And now if you want to search for Python, you would type in Python, and now you double click, and you have several examples. For instance, the median filter, which uses Python to uh, perform a 3D median filter on, on an image. And you can see, um, uh, as, and you can see uh, how, it, how it's written. And, and again, th there is somehow an effort to, first of all, to document all the bar scripts. I think that's important, because otherwise they're not useful as templates and as, as learning exercises. And the other exercise is to make them general and modular. So it means that you probably, you should be able to take a method from one script and and you know and use it in another one without much um, fiddling. Uh, okay, so for instance, this extremely simple one snippet allows you to parse the results table and to calculate nearest table distance from two columns. So, for instance, if you run it um, to ask it for some demo data, it um, calculates the nearest distance, assigns a the nearest uh, neighbor distance uh, between uh, to each row, and then because we already have a bar that creates, um, you know, uh, nicely looking histograms, it calls it for you, and then it creates histograms. Just to give an example of, of by generating um, general uh, general commands, you you can call them. Um, you can uh, in a more it's more productive way. Is, is that okay? Any questions? Do you guys want to go for a break or no? Okay. So, okay, so let's now, okay, that was the pi introduction to scripting. And again, it, it doesn't really, um, it was Python, could have been any other language. I don't think if you are not, um, I don't think it's important the discussion which language to use, which language is more important, doesn't really matter. All the languages have advantages and disadvantages, and the truth is that even in terms of speed, speed is hardly a bottleneck, I guess, for the work that most of us does, because computers are now pretty much uh, extremely fast. So unless you are really doing, you know, that kind of optimization is not really required. So any language would be suitable. Python is great, Pinchel is great, JavaScript is great, it doesn't really doesn't really matter which language you are trying to, um, to adopt. OK, so let's close the Python tutorial. Let's just close some of these images. And let's now go through the other tutorials that are, that are the bin shell. And again, these are scripts already that you can run yourself. So if I press the Shift key to open them, and it's basically telling, if you read the script, what it's basically telling is telling the script editor to go to the tutorials folder of bar and to just open in, in a separate tabs all the files that end with the bin shell extension. So you run that, that's what you run from the command, and now you have all your tutor bin shell tutorials here. So again, I'm going to make this bigger. And we can actually toggle, I can actually toggle by using page down you can actually use page down and page up to toggle between different tabs. OK, so bin shell. Um, bin shell is great. Um, it's perhaps one of my favorite um, languages because it's basically um, simplified Java or no frills Java. And the great thing about it is that um, you can mix and match Java code with bin shell code. And it will always, the bin shell interpreter will, will uh, treat them um, exactly the same way. And so it's, it's great because it allows you to 
uh, you know, create some draft of a script that then if it becomes very complex, it can very easily convert it in Java and the other way around. The Java code that is highly complex can be, you know, simplified into bin shell. Okay, so some of the basics of the language are here. We went this for Python, you'll see they're very, you know, the concepts are very similar. They're all, they are all object-oriented languages. So bin shell also has a print statement. In this case, it's slightly different from Python because it only allows one argument. Well, Python, you could use multiple arguments with, uh, separated by commas. So in this case, if you want to print, you know, the hello command, you, you have to, com to um, uh, aggregate the strings with the plus operator. Okay, and math works as expected, the same way as in Python. You can sum numbers, you can assign them to variables. Um, this is how you do exponenti you know, exponentiation. You, you know, there are, well, actually different ways of doing it. And so you can print all these variables into a line. So if I press run, line 30 should have given the result there, separated by commas. We have the same problem of the DV, not problem, the same, you have to be careful with this when you are dividing uh, variables because you have, when you don't define their data type a priori, as in Python. And as in Python also, in bin shell, variables can be dynamically typed. So you, if you have a variable that's assigned, a number that's assigned to a variable, you can later on assign it, to, you can assign it a string to it, and it will always work. So it's a bit, uh, this is great, um, could lead you to some problems down the road um, if you don't, um, as you, some operations that will, may only be allowed with certain data types, but we'll go back in a second to that. Now, so it's very flexible, and it's very, as you can see, it's very reminiscent if you are aware of the image marker language, actually, with the difference that it allows you to access the, the full API of the image. Okay, these are some examples of the operators. So, for instance, you see here in line 43, um, A equals B, A equals different to B, you can, you can negate things and so forth. So, let's go to there's exercise number two, an if statement is exactly the same way it works in Java. Um, so here's an if statement, you use we use curly braces for that. Um, while in Python we only use the indentation. Um, use, we use the white space to define what is inside the if statement on, on what is outside. And um, so, no, so that, that was an if statement um, with uh, multiple if sentence. Um, and you can go through it. Um, this is how you, def you define arrays exactly as you would do in Java also. So in this case, uh, value, uh, uh, an array with numbers, an array with strings. You can also do it in an empty. You can declare an empty array by specifying the array size. And then you can assign positions individually. Okay, so in this case you assign, so uh, Java, bin shell, Python, they're all zero based array. So basically the position, the first position in the array is always um, uh, zero, the second position in the array is position number one, the third position number two, and so forth. I guess this is all, this is not, this is all common knowledge. Um, and this is an example for for loop, okay? So you basically would loop, um, you can loop through um, all the positions in the array and assign a, uh, and assign a value to that particular position in the array. But you can also use enhanced for loops as you will use in Java. So for instance, you can use by using um, the syntax, you can actually use, um, you know, you can loop for each item in the array. Okay, so bin shell supports it very well. Another another cool thing about bin shell, which I actually, I guess you probably are all aware of it, but I was actually quite surprised by it, is that switch statements, which are a common, you know, um, a special kind of if, if statements in Java, um, bin shell actually supports, you can do it with any, any object, so it can be you, you anything you can basically switch over. Um, while in Java, this is restricted typically to strings, integers, and, and characters. So for instance, if you, a switch statement is basically a special kind of if, if else statement that allows multiple execution paths. So for instance, if you have a variable that you assign um, libre and then you, you, know, you can basically switch through it and, and check for different cases. Okay. So bin shell supports those beautifully. And uh, there you go, so that's more basics. Okay, imports, importing classes and, Java, uh, and packages, Java packages work exactly as it would do in Java. Um, it's exactly the same thing, but as in Python, it's more, slightly, more, it's slightly more flexible. 
because you can place the import anywhere in your files. And this, I think, is actually quite useful because you, it allows you to declare the import inside um, functions that you define. So the import files are not, um, can be always tethered to your specific function. Here is an example of a, of a method that takes no arguments. We've seen this before. So we import a package, we declare the object, we output it. This one has arguments. And again, you can do, um, you can specify the data type of, of the argument or not. It can be uh, flexible. It's very flexible in the way. So in this case, we don't. It allows uh, for any you know, doubles, integers, any data type. In this case, we, we, we specifically uh, declare the data type. This is a void method example. And um, that's it. So now as Python, the equivalent in bin shell is for the global keyword, is the super keyword. And this is a slight variance from Java that you won't, you won't see it. So for instance, if you have a variable that is declared outside the scope of your method, so in this case, a variable called variable, um, you assign the value two. So um, and if you then declare it inside um, the method, um, you can test what is going to happen. Uh, basically, you want to be able to, to change its value, but if you use the super keyword, then you can. Again, this idea that we discussed with Python's global keyword. And now I have, you know, and these will not work for rules with query variables. So if you don't query the data type, this, will not, this is not no longer going to be the case. And I will allow, I let you check it by yourself. Okay. So bar libs, let's go libraries of your own. Let's create our own library. So the idea here is that you, the idea is, is here to be productive is that, oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's true. I I didn't. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. I didn't mention that. Yeah. It, this promiscuity has, you know, bites you later on if you, uh, because you forget that you declared upstream and then. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. You're right. No, sorry. What do you mean, sorry? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. But I never came. I never really have the need to to do it, though. I think. Uh, again, all Bintel is great, but if you are really doing more sophisticated, you're probably better off sticking to Java, I guess. I, I guess I'm highlighting some of the advantages. I'm kind of, but I don't want to be, you know, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to hide. The, there are disadvantages. Yeah. Um, Yeah, but there, there are things that are also, um, well, uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk about later them also. So, uh, okay, so I guess the, the rationale, the real rationale for writing bar was this idea of, you know, I always, you probably came across this also, where you write your macros for image A and then, you know, you have your function there or, or you write your script and you have your method there. And then you write another one and you copy and paste it there and you keep on copy and pasting and, and using 
code that you've been reading again. So why not just you know load it from a centralized library that you you know is shared across multiple scripts, and that was the idea of of bar. So 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 bar comes with the, uh, with a built-in command that is. Um, that allows you to create a, uh, basically a snip. So let's create one from bin shell, for instance. You select the language here. OK. And it tells you, uh, so basically, all these scripting languages allow you to load methods from you know, specified files. So in this case, so bar comes with some libraries for, for all the language, bin shell, Python, Clojure, and so forth. So, um, so let's just you know, I'll run the snippet code here. I'll, I'll create it. And now let's see where the file is. So let's open the commander and the libraries. Files are here. And you see there is a bin shell library there called barlib. Let's open it also. And it's, you know, this will guide you through like how these are um, declared. So for instance, you can see inside the, the, the bar library, there is a method called confirm loading. And if I load the library, I'm able to evoke that method there. So for instance. There you go. So I'm, you are actually, so now you can share this method across multiple files. And I'll give you a practical example of this. Oh, this is useful. And I'll, I think this will make you more productive. Well, make us more productive. At least makes me more productive. So for instance, there is, let's open some sample image, some bogus image. Um, and again, let's create a plot profile, OK, which is great. But sometimes your image is noisy, and so um, you may want to smooth the profile to have an over, an, an, a better idea of what's going on in your image. So if you go here in the bar command, there is a, a smooth profile command. Okay, and now you, it allows you basically to create a smooth plot. Okay. Now the cool thing about well, the cool thing about this library is that you can see, so that in the red you have. So we have the smoothing curve. I can, you can actually adjust it dynamically. So I can make it an exaggerated amount. OK, so now it's extreme. You know, it just basically makes a walking average of your function, OK? There in red. So if you open this file, the smooth plot profile, and if you go through it, you see that actually the smoothing function is loaded from the library. So the smoothing function is actually defined here. Because it's a, a walking, a, a, a simple uh, moving average function is very common and we use it all the time. So why not just write it once and then share it across all the scripts? So to illustrate the point, I guess, so imagine that, okay, this is all good, but you know, a simple moving average is kind of a silly, uh, you know, smoothing way of, uh, of smoothing data. So imagine that you want a Gaussian fu function, okay? So let's create a Gaussian function, add it to the library, and then um, we, we can just uh, alter the behavior of the, of the smooth script. OK. So, so there you go. So these, here you would open the smooth plot profile. That's basically what I did before manually. This tutorial will do it for you, these files. You press Run. It opens the file for you. OK. OK, so now let's find the function in the in the library, so you can see the function is here. And now let's say you want to do um, a Gaussian fit. And OK, you can go through the tutorial. So basically, the Gaussian fit is done by the curve fitter that is uh, built in in ImageJ. And we, you know, so we, again, we can put the import inside the function. We created the curve fitter object. We perform the fit. And then we take, we assign, um, so the curve fitter takes two to uh, arguments, the array of x values and that y values. And then we can assign, um, and then we can just output the array uh, field with the fitted value. So we take this function, we copy and paste it into the, our library. OK, I've done that already. OK, so now we can just go to your smooth profile, find where the library is, is being loaded here. Now we can run it, and it will. You'll have a fitting curve, a Gaussian fit. Press it live. And of course, because it only allows for it only detects one pick, so you can see the, the Gaussian being fitted to the highest pick at all the times. 
And you see, like, it, this is a live plot, so the, the performance, there is really no, um, it works well. And I think, and this is what, what drove me to create bar is that I do think that this streamlines a lot of, scr of scripting routines in Mojave because you just make your favorite methods available to all your scripts and then you start poking them. And but um, and so basically, what bar allows you is just a convenient way to to do this. So basically, it, it provides you with a with a code to to load these libraries. It allows you it you know provides you a file browser so you can organize your snippets. Um, it allows you a way to find them and so forth. It's just a text file. Yeah. So the way, so you can you can see that if you go into the. So you copy and paste that whole file into the register. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Libraries have no. Uh, they are not. They are not re registered in the menu. So if you reveal that, because you say they have, they are not registered in the menu. Because in Fiji, they, this will only happen if they have an underscore. So they are not executable in that sense. So you have to evoke them. And this is on purpose because it allows you to create, this is intentional because it allows you to create multiple libraries and they will not be executable by the, in, through the manual hierarchy. Yeah, so that's the problem. So that's, that's what next. Yeah, so you don't know what, what they are available. Right now, you know, it's pretty primitive. It's just, uh, right now, it's just, um, um, it. you have to just look at it. The idea is that because you created them, you will remember them. <laughs> but, I, but, but hopefully, in the future, there will be a way that we could, because dynamically, dynamically print out what is available. That, that will be the goal, to basically parse each library. And because each function has already a, a Java doc, documentation, it will parse those. And that will be, that will be great if you want to do it. That actually, yeah. Yeah, it will be that. That will be the the useful. That, now, there are some caveats to it. There are some problems with it. That actually, you know, I've been using these on my own computer, and sure, it fulfills my needs. But as soon as you make it, you know, broadly available to use, the, 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 you know, there's going to happen. Some things are going to happen. Is, is for instance, is that, you know, every time I I put an update into the library. You know, is going to override your file, or is, you know, so we'll have to find a way to, to cope with that. So the idea, you know, the idea would be that, you know, bar users would have their own personal libraries that would not, you know, that would be in different files, and then there would be some com some commonality, some things that are really um, useful, and those will be distributed through the update side. Yeah, that would be cool. Again, this was um, when I started. Actually, I this was just my you know this was it was just really to to help me doing my own my own thing. I never really expected that it would be uh, you know became a, a thing that other people would would use. Actually, so it's kind of um, how do you say? I didn't put much thought into it. Actually, <laughs> it was dri yeah exactly. It was driven by necessity. So the other thing is that. Um, um, you know, so these, you know, th there are some, some of these things are discussed here in the last tutorial. You know, so I guess the point, and that maybe comes to what you were saying, is that so, you know, if, if libraries are just files, so why don't you just, you know, call the functions directly from the scripts where they exist, right? And the problem is that because those scripts are execute. Exec they, you know, you can execute them. They have executable instructions in them. So if you load them, they would ex they would run immediately. So if you would call the the smooth profile, the smooth the, if you had the the walking average function in your smooth profile, when you call it, it would start running. So that basically bypasses that. And the other pro the other thing that you know I was talking is that you know if if they are distributed for the update side, it means that you, 
you know you will have to we have you know if you have really some routines that you use that you have personalized they would have to be in different files otherwise you know the updater would complain that they have been modified locally You know, just to give an example, so there's lots of, um, so if you want to get more into, you know, bar scripts, another way you could do it is to use, um, uh, to ser use the search function. So this is basically a modified macro that allows you to search within the bar folder. So, you know, it takes, so um, it's here. It's search bar so it takes it basically you can put the string in the, in the clipboard and to run it so this is what is exemplifying here so if, if you want to search for bin shell we place bin shell um, you know extension in the clipboard and it will pick up for you so then you can search and this is searches through the image built in command so now you have all the bin shells um, scripts in the um, that are present in bar so again this is not very uh, you know it's is not uh, there are some limitations to it so the other thing I wanted to show you is that there there are some convenience methods that I always I found it were useful in the bar API so that you can browse online also where for instance you can find especially with utilities methods and the plotting the plot utils methods so for instance um, this allow this provides you convenience methods for um, exporting j3 shards as um, uh, PDFs or uh, scalar SVGs, so you can incorporate this in your own uh, projects, and it and it and basically allows you to have several utilities commands for uh, interacting basically with uh, mainly with uh, the file browser of your uh, native operating system. And the other aspect to bar is that I tried also the idea is really make an emphasis in the documentation. So the documentation right now. Is on is for GitHub. So actually, uh, each of the bar subfolders or each of the bar um, submenus is has a, a markdown document, and this is what you're reading here. So you can actually browse while you are browsing through the source code. You can actually browse through the documentation itself. So for instance, if you go within the analysis folder where all the scripts are, you have the readme file that goes through. It documents each of them. You can click on them and you can access. Most of the bars are self-contained, so you would, and if they are not, so you can actually use them in, in image A alone, or uh, with or without the the, uh, the bar update site. And if some um, first-party dependencies require, you should get a warning when you when you use them. Hopefully. Um, That's it. Actually, this is what I had to show it to you today. Um, I don't know if you want to have, uh, you want to do something else, or you want to explore it further, or. Um. Not really. You want to go for a break before the Omero workshop, or? Yeah, let's do that then. Thanks. <laughs>